So why would a loving God condemn someone who's never even heard of him? If you've been with me for the last few videos, we've been diving into that one, but in this, the final video of the section, we're gonna take everything we've been talking about as far as the elements involved and some of the hidden factors, we're gonna bring everything out to light and we're gonna see if we can actually come up with the answer. Stick around. Hi everybody, Chris F. Walker, thanks for joining me today. Uh, if you've been with me for these last few videos, we've gone into pretty deep on some of the elements that are involved in what seems to many people like a simple question and they want a simple answer. The problem is, this is what we call an iceberg question. The reason why is because on the surface it might seem like it's pretty simple, but there's so much underlying beneath it uh, that is, is so complicated that it's not something that we can just sit there and say, oh, well, two plus two, that means it's four. Well, this is more like those kind of algebraic, you know, equations that you see on the, you know, the, the chalkboards at NASA uh, that you're looking at going like, I don't, I don't even get half of that. Well, that's why we have to dive through and explain each different element of it so that we can get to uh, where it comes out. You can see why it, the outcome is what it is, okay? Now, if you haven't seen those other videos, please go back. I've got links in the, the, the description below to each of the videos. But so far, some of the elements we've been breaking into is we already had to explore that what are at play here as far as the question goes. Uh, some of the things that we can extrapolate is that we're obviously questioning God's sovereignty, we're questioning God's love, and we're questioning God's justice. All of those are at play in something like this question. But one of the real things that I've found has always been a great place to try and bring to light when elements like this are, you know, being questioned, is is there an example somewhere in the Bible that we could then turn to and say, has this happened before? And believe it or not, the answer is yes. So jump with me into the book again. Acts chapter 10, verses 20 to 22. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. And verses 30 through 33. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Now, obviously, I only shared sections of that story. I highly encourage you to make sure that you break, uh, break the Bible open and uh, really dive into that whole story because there's a lot going on in there. But one of the things that we can start doing is we can start kind of picking out certain elements uh, that play in the question that's posed. Does this, you know, can we see this in this example? And the answer, of course, is that yes, we can break out quite a few different things. For example, uh, the Roman who is in question here, he didn't know Christ and he honestly didn't know any of the, uh, he might have heard stories about the, the, the prophets or whoever it is that's wandering around, but for most Romans at the time, uh, Jesus was considered to be dead and as far as this whole Christian movement thing goes on, it was really more of just kind of a new, uh, newsome headache, but no different from the same, uh, you know, single God view that uh, was there before Christ. So in their view, they're probably just looking at this as like, man, these crazy, uh, you know, Israeli people, they don't even have their act together. I mean, we've, we've had our gods for all of our society. They can't even make up their mind whether or not they're gods, you know, like in the past or even somebody who was here living and that we just killed them. I mean, they've got so much going on that they don't even know their own story. That's probably what was going through most Romans' heads. But what the thing is that's interesting here is that we find out that God actually reached into the life through a dream of the Roman and said that I want you to seek out this person. That person, of course, being Paul. At the same time that that's happening, God's also working with Paul and he's giving him dreams too. And what he's telling him is, 
uh, you know, I was using the analogy uh, at the time of uh, different animals and how we eat certain things and the laws of that, but the context that was being taught to Paul was that the way is open for everyone. And so the first question is, why would God, or would a loving God condemn someone who's never heard of him? The first thing is that what you're assuming is that somehow God can't reach those people. That's false. That is absolutely a false viewpoint according to the biblical scriptures. The Bible says that basically God can reach anyone, anytime, anywhere, however he chooses. And so if salvation is something that's on his heart, the point is he's going to reach out to those individuals somehow, some way. The other thing is that he's called Paul to be a messenger of that salvation story because God didn't just give the whole story to the Roman. Instead, he actually calls Paul to be the one who, prov who provides him with the story of Jesus Christ. All that he did was create the meeting. And if you think about what the context of the Great Commission, which is ultimately where we're going to end up with this, the real context there is that that's what Jesus gives us when we're Christians. When you're a Jesus follower, he, can, he calls us to you know, uh, baptize and make disciples in the names of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to the ends of the earth and that he will go with us in the process. So this concept of uh, basically saying that because God never, because they never heard about God, uh, that, that God somehow didn't reach them, that's actually not true. According to the biblical viewpoint, according to the Christian viewpoint, God can reach anywhere, anytime, for any purpose. Now, the difference is in the views of the story of Christ, what God has given those of us who have heard him is a calling. But when we say calling, a lot of times what people kind of misconstrue, and this is where this question comes up, would God condemn someone uh, who's never heard of him? What they're kind of saying is, what about the people you're not going to get to? Because we can just assume that you haven't reached them all. And I mean, here we are in the modern day and age with just a, a flip of a switch, uh, a single word can make its way around the entire world within a matter of seconds. But that doesn't mean that it does. There are still plenty, in fact, millions of people on this planet who have not been reached by the gospel message. And so when we're sitting here saying, okay, well, basically what happens to those people that you didn't get to them? What they're saying is you realize you won't succeed in your lifetime at reaching everyone with your message. And the answer is, of course we know that. The big difference here is, does that then mean that we should not be conducting ourselves as though that was a calling that was given to us? You see, the thing about what we're understanding, this is why I remember at the very beginning we had to address God's sovereignty first. See, God's sovereignty means that he does not need us to save anyone. In fact, we weren't part of the salvation story at all. It was all God. God did everything that has to do with salvation. So the only thing we brought to the table was the sin in the first place. Now, what that then translates into is what we're saying is when, okay, well, what happens to the people we don't reach? The first thing is if you're an outsider looking in, the first question really is, does that mean that God uh, is using them peop those people just to, you know, being Christians, obviously, uh, just to basically kind of grow the church so they can get more tithes on Sunday? And if that's the goal of Christianity, then I would agree that we are a false uh, belief, and that's really not the point of the Christian message. Because it's not. That's not at the heart of the Christian message. The Christian message is not about putting a lot of people into seats and then trying to fill your church on Sunday. Uh, the point of the Christian message is about redemption, and it's about sharing and kindness and love, but then saying how God saved you, so then you can tell other people that he can do the same for them. It's really that simple. The problem here doesn't really lie in the context of God. God's not the problem. The problem is actually us. And if you follow it along with the logic and all of this, that's the point. God's 100% sovereign, he's 100% love, and he's 100% justice. What he doesn't need is us. God does not need us. What he calls is us. He invites us to be a part in this. So when a Christian hears, would a loving God condemn those who have not heard, the first question that probably should be on our heart is, who are they, where are they, and how can I get to them? <laughs> I mean, it's really more of a call to action than it is a question against uh, the validity of God. But for those who are outside of the viewpoints of God, what they're questioning are things like, is there a sovereign God? Does he have justice? Does he have love? And if he isn't all of these things anyway, why should I believe in him? And that's a valid question. If he isn't all of those things, then you're right. He's not God. And it's at least not the God that the Christians are believing in. But as we've tried to dive into with this series, I hope 
that we've expressed enough in this that you can at least grow a little bit closer into the context that these are valid points uh, that do in fact have legitimacies that God is sovereign, God is love, and God is justice. And all three of those are at play. The other thing that's a little bit disheartening with hearing this question is that what it kind of also presumes is that basically God picks favorites, that he's got certain people that he loves more than others. And the reason why that's a very common worldly view is because that's what we do. Uh, it's very common for us to turn around and be like, if I've got to choose between a complete stranger or my son, I'm picking my son. That's just natural for us. But for God, he's got this real kind of inclination that every one of us is his child. And so one of the nice things that's really cool about how God works his terms of equality is the fact that he loves everyone equally, which is to the absolute max. No one can love us more than him but that he also then gives us different gifts. And there's a lot, and again, we're, we're gonna go down, that's a whole different rabbit hole, and I'm not diving into that with this series. But we aren't all given the same uh, level of, of talent. We aren't, we're not all given the same placement on the earth. We're not all put in the same time period. We're not all treated the same in the context of when, where, and how we were created and what we were created to be. But that doesn't mean that we're loved any less. And that's one of the biggest things about what we then look at from the Christian worldview in terms of equality is the fact that God, what, God loves all of us equally in terms of value, but he also gives all of us different roles in terms of what we get to contribute to his kingdom. And that's not out of limitation, it's actually out of an invitation to see that not only do we get to have a relationship directly with him individually, that's the up and down, but we also then get to learn how to greet and love on one another who have different gifts and different talents that we can all then, you know, combine with and create a beautiful society that we can love each other as well. And by the way, that's also in the Bible from God, from Jesus's own mouth is when they asked him specifically, what are the greatest commandments? And he told them the greatest commandments are love God with all your heart, your mind, your body, your soul, and your spirit, and love your neighbor like yourself. That's the point. It's an up and down and a side to side. It's not one or the other. It's both. In a way, it's not uh, uncommon or not uncanny to think that what Jesus got nailed to was in fact a cross. Because in a way, that's kind of what he was accomplishing, was he was bringing everything into one location so that it could be resolved. That's the point of the crucifixion, was to resolve all of these issues. Now what he's inviting us into is the ability to share that with others. That doesn't mean he needs us. And that also doesn't then, because he doesn't need us, doesn't excuse us to say that we don't we don't need to contribute, we should. He's calling us into it. And in fact, the real point of this is when someone's bringing this element to light, what it really is expressing is, do we feel like we will be blessed for our efforts of growing God's kingdom as opposed to working towards the efforts of growing our kingdom? And I wanted to share a personal example because this happened to me and it was one of the elements where I started seeing this kind of click into place. I wasn't always a Christian. I was an atheist for most of my life. And that's a story that, again, we can get into another time, uh, not the topic of this video. But recently, during the COVID time, my grandmother passed. And when she passed, I hadn't really had a chance to kind of develop any kind of a relationship with her prior, post being saved. From the time I became a Christian, I really didn't have much of a relationship with my grandmother. And that's one of the things I do regret but it's just a truth, I didn't do it. And so when she passed, I had to ask the question of myself, I don't know if she believed in God. I don't know if she had a relationship with God. And I was praying, saying, God, this is weighing on my heart. I don't know if grandma's up there. How do I know that she was saved? Or how do I understand that? And the first thing that comes back to mind when I'm asking questions like this is that God asks, usually asks questions when we ask hard. When we ask hard questions, it's usually common for him to ask a question back because he's trying to draw out the truth from us. And the first thing that I had back as far as a question was, was it my job to save her? Of course, the answer is no. There's only one person that saves everybody. That's his job. His role is to be the savior. So it wasn't my job to be a savior. So I can't feel guilt about the people that I didn't necessarily get to uh, know for sure if they had a relationship with God. But the other thing that he points out is that he knew her just as well as he knows me. He knew her for as long as she was here. 
He put her here when he chose. He took her here when he ch he took her from here when he chose. And in between, the question is, do I believe that God had the intention of redeeming her to himself? And based off of everything we've seen in the Bible and even uh, throughout history, what we can definitely say is that God's intention is for redemption of everyone. He does intend that. So does that mean then that it fell on me to be the one that got her the message? Maybe, maybe not. But the whole point was she was on this earth for decades before I even showed up. If there was an opportunity for God to reach her in a way for her to say yes to him, he did it. Now, whether or not she chose it is on her. And that's something that he won't share with us. He won't share that with me. I don't get to know that. Until I show up in heaven and find out if my grandmother's there, I won't get to know. And there are some who, do, who believe also that even when we get to heaven, the only people we'll know are the people that are there. We won't remember any of the ones that were here that chose not to be there. So the element that really comes into play when it comes to whether or not God is willing to condemn those who've never heard of him is to say, one, no one gets to claim ignorance. Otherwise, justice is not just. Two, God's motive is to redeem everyone, and he doesn't need us to be the ones that bring the message. If there's a way to be saved, he'll do it. But that doesn't mean we know all those methods. And that's the other thing that we have to then express and accept with this concept is the fact that we're not God. God's ways are higher than ours, and he knows more than we do. So the reality about whether or not someone uh, was able to receive the salvation of Christ is something that's entirely between them and God, and we'll never get to know it. But that's not what we're called to do anyway. We're not called to answer that. We're called to share our message. We're called to tell the story of Christ. And that way we get to be part of what he's doing. Does that mean that's the only means that he is using for salvation is just our word of mouth? Maybe, maybe not. You see, this is where it's gonna be a little tricky. The only thing we know for sure is that he has called us to share the message. What he never tells us is, is he doing something other than using us to share the message to make sure that everyone can have that means of salvation? We don't know. He never told us. And since he never told us, that doesn't necessarily mean that because it's not told to us means it's not happening. The only thing we can say, and this is where I told you guys at the very beginning of the series, some of us are gonna grow in our faith in this, and some of us are gonna be very disappointed at the end. Because at the end of this, what happens is, does God condemn those who have never heard of him? We don't know. Because we don't know for sure if they heard of him or if they understood him. We don't know for sure what God did outside of us to reach them. We don't know what their decisions were. We don't know what their choices were. So we don't know. But the thing is, that's not our place to know, because then we'd be the judge. God's the judge. That's the point. Guys, I want to thank you for diving into this with me. I know this is a deep dive to come right back up to a, we don't have a clear answer. But one of the things that I've found as we've, as these iceberg style questions come up, especially when I was questioning a lot of this stuff myself, which eventually led me to becoming a Christian, was that if you dive into these iceberg questions, if you really go at the heart and the subtle nuances of everything that's involved, you're gonna start learning more about who God is. And as you grow closer to him and you learn more about who he is, that's what the whole point is. See, one of the things that I then brought up is when someone says, would a loving God condemn someone who's never heard of him? I have to then turn around and say, what's the purpose of your question? What's the motive you're hoping for? If you're hoping to say, how does he reach those of us, how does he reach the people who, you know, we know we haven't reached yet? Well, then the answer is, he's already told us what he wants us to do. Go reach them. That's the Great Commission. If the answer of why you asked the question is, you're trying to outsmart a Christian and just say, well, because you don't know these answers, well, then what I would say is that's an invitation to grow closer and understand more about the concepts of who God is. Learn more about who is, what, how is, who is love is. Because remember, God is love. Look into that. How does it work? Do you understand it? What about his justice? Is it true? Is it righteous? Can we trust it? Dive into it. And what about his sovereignty? 
Are you willing to submit to his, his authority over your life? Those are the kinds of things that come up with an iceberg question. So even though we might not have a specific answer, did you or did you not grow in your faith, grow in your relationship closer to God? And if you did, maybe that's the point. Guys, take care. God bless. We'll see you next time.